Let's stand. We're going to sing another song. It's going to be, um, I just turned from the, I just turned from the page I was supposed to be at. 468, <laughs> Be Thou My Vision. We're not only singing about our God, we're singing to our God this morning. That's okay. Whatever key you want, as long as it's the right song. <laughs> Thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that Thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, my present, my light. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with one. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Amen. Thank you, John. We appreciate that. Good morning to you. So glad that you're here. Take your Bibles, please. We're turning to Genesis chapter 28. We're going to be reading verses 16 through 22 this morning. First book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 28, beginning with verse 16 and reading through the 22nd. I'm going to have you stand with me for the reading of God's holy word. We'll keep you animated early on here in this service, and then you can fall asleep once the pastor starts preaching. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful, how awesome is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, I will give and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Thank you. You may be seated for a time of prayer. Oh God, we rejoice in you again today. Certainly acknowledge and and, uh, revel in your love that, that we experience every moment of every day, but a love that was displayed and demonstrated in a pinnacle way on Calvary's cross as we have already acknowledged. 
reminded of your great sacrifice for us again today. Reminded of the practical fact that you took our place on Calvary's cross. You bore the penalty of our sin. You suffered through our hell so that we wouldn't have to. We pause to thank you again for our salvation so rich and free in Christ and Christ alone. Too precious to be earned, only to be received. Again, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that prompts us to pray as we faithfully do for those who may be here today or within the sound of this voice who have not yet put personal faith and trust in the one and only Savior from sin. O oh God, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. And again, as we have sung, we desire to exalt you and you alone. And thank you, Lord, that worship uh, really is and ought to be a, a way of life for God's people. And that we certainly worship you in our singing, if such flows from our hearts. And we worship you in all the different aspects of our service. And, and then especially with note this morning as we before too long, we'll be opening up the pages of your book. God, we worship you through and with your word. So I pray that you'd be pleased with us. I pray that you would continue to minister to each one, meet every need. Thank you for the privilege of being in this place. Thank you for the joy of knowing you, God. And Lord, the joy in serving you. May we be faithfully marked by these things. May you be pleased as we proceed, I pray for Jesus' sake and in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Um, I think we all can agree that the last couple of years have been hard um, with all of the sickness and hatred and things going on in the world right now um, my heart has been very heavy and uh, <clears throat> one of the ways that I have um, been able to draw closer to the Lord is through music and um, just pouring my heart out to him and through those emotions and things and um one of uh, my prayers, instead of being come, mean, discouraged, which uh, I think is very easy to do right now, my prayer has been that the Lord would um, use this time to help me to focus more on eternity and just um, grow in my longing for his return and um, my desire just to... Um, reach out to those around us, and uh, that's my prayer for each one of us, um, and so I'm going to share my song with you. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10:23. storms that you have weathered feels like this road just might go on forever carry on you keep on giving but every day this world just keeps on taking your tired heart is on the edge of breaking carry on weary traveler restless soul you were never meant to walk this road alone it'll all be worth it so just hold on
you're searching. Heaven's healing's gonna find where all the hurt is. When Jesus calls, we'll lay down all our heavy burdens. Carry on, oh. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Someday soon we're going to make it home. Someday soon we're going to make it home. Someday soon we're going to make it home. Going to make it You are never meant to walk this road alone. It'll all be worth it. So just hold on. Weary traveler, you won't be weary long. Weary traveler, you won't be weary long. Weary traveler, you won't be weary Thank you, Andrea, both for your song, which was a big encouragement to us, and then your testimony as well, which was uh, a challenge uh, for us. We appreciate that. Let's pray together. God, the song has uh, stirred our hearts in a lot of different ways. We are reminded of uh, your words recorded by Matthew, where you said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest and couldn't help but think of that beautiful invitation as Andrea was singing. And of course, we are reminded of all of your different promises that come into play with such situation as well. And then I also thought of your words to your disciples of which we are just a little while and in light of all of that then, and with a view to the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ, O oh God, that we would be occupying until you come, O oh God, that we'd be finishing well. Again, we know one of the ways in which we can do that and must do that is by our engaging the word of God, aided by the spirit of God, properly understanding it, and then in his power, practically applying it to our lives. And so, God, I pray that you would, once again this morning, apply to our hearts your inscripturated truth. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Our study in Genesis continues. We're presently working our way through chapter 28, most recently considering Jacob's dream. And I pause again this morning to say, oh, what a dream. Uh, I, I may lose you with what I'm about to say to you, but wow, do you and I do an awful lot of dreaming. I am glad, frankly, that by the time that I wake up, you know, um, to go for the day, I am glad that almost always I have forgotten the content of the dream. Sometimes our dreams are funny. I've woken up in the middle of the night literally laughing in regard to the ludicrousy of my dream. Many of you, by the way, would be surprised at how often you are in my dreams and the things that you say and do. Sometimes our dreams are frightening. 
And so we have to pray and at times even get up and open up the word of God. Our nightmares can seem so real. Sometimes our dreams are funny. Sometimes our dreams are frightening. And always, in some measure, they are fanciful, i.e. untrue. I am so glad that God no longer communicates divine revelation through dreams. I am so glad for the completed canon of Scripture. I am so glad for the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. But Jacob readily recognizes the divinity of his dream. And as we've noted, he's about to go in that dream, just like you and I now, in this different dispensation, if you will, must be going in the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Dreams at the time, divine dreams, were divine revelation. But what, now we have such completed and inscripturated for us. In the dream that Jacob dreamed, God reiterates to him the Abrahamic covenant, assuring Jacob that the Abrahamic covenant is going to flow through him and his immediate descendants. This is what we have in verses 13 through 15. I'm reminding you of that via reading. So Genesis 28, verses 13 through 15. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land wherein thou liest. To thee will I give it, and to thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places to which thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of to thee. We pick up this morning with verse 16 and following. I'm reading verse 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. This, of course, contextually is very encouraging to Jacob. This is a very positive statement that we have here in verse 16, but don't miss the inherent challenge in these words. Too often, God is in a certain place and God's people don't know it. Think of some of the implications of that, that we are at any moment unconscious of God. And if we are at any given moment unconscious of God, then we certainly are not actively praying. We are not actively trusting. We are not actively fellowshipping. We are not actively com communing. We are not actively walking with God. I remind you this morning of God's omnipresence. He is everywhere. I, I remind you of God's wonderful compound name, Jehovah Shoma. That's Ezekiel 40. That's Ezekiel 48 and verse 35. The Lord is there. I remind you that God has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. He will no, 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 never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5, and as such there are for 
the people of God, for the child of God, there is no God forsaken place. God is to be met. I, I, th this is fundamental. I know I'm not telling you anything new, but this is vital and crucial as we seek to live out our lives in these last days in such a way so that our lives impact many people for the cause of Christ, for the good of God and the good of God's word. God is to be met in every place, every circumstance. And of course, inseparably linked to God's presence is his peace and protection and provision, which means, class, that really all we need to know is whether God is there, and he is. All we really need to know is that if God, is whether or not God is present, and again, he is. That's verse 15. What a wonderful encouragement to Jacob. But the flip side of that coin is that we can practically and fortunately, temporarily miss God. We can, for even an extended period of time, be unconscious of God. And then potentially, again, practically miss much of his provision. Honestly, so that you're with me, there are many times when my life is not marked by peace, and the reason why it's not marked by peace is because I'm in the process of neglecting God and the word of God. By the way, the psalmist says, great peace have they that love thy law. But, and, and this is a good reminder for us because we continue to counsel one another, and indeed we should. And you probably shouldn't be surprised if sometime I'm knocking on your door and I'm one sad pap puppy and I'm saying, oh, my, my life is falling apart. I am disconcerted about practically everything. And you in turn ask me if I've been engaging God in his word and I say, no, I have not. And you, in turn, say, well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what the problem is. It's an amazing how often we neglect God. Isn't it amazing how often we neglect God's words? Isn't it amazing how often we are unconscious of God, unconscious of God's promises? But Jacob's dream sets the record straight for Jacob. Take a look at verse 17. I'm reading again. And he was afraid and said, How awesome or dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. You'll be interested in noting that the word afraid and the word dreadful or awesome both come from the same Hebrew word, yare, which means to fear and revere, to revere and fear, to fear and revere, to revere and fear. We've noted in the past that the Hebrew idea of fearing God is fourfold. I have not in all of my years come across a better rendering and definition of what it means to fear God than this. Walk in his word, respect his will, tremble to offend, hasten to serve. Walk in his word, respect his will, tremble to offend, hasten to serve. We, we see that in its incipient form here with Jacob. Class, Jacob is in the process of becoming a God-fearer. And the process is exciting. And the process is something that we can identify through the narrative, the biblical narrative, and the prospect of such process unfolding in your and my life is also very exciting. Oh, that we would be among the God-fearers. It 
Verse 17b, J- Jacob references two different but related things. You see that? The, you got to love this. The house of God and the gate of heaven. I would suggest to you that both of these things are inseparably linked to Christ. Remember that Christ is the ladder in Jacob's dream. And the fact of the matter is you and I cannot talk about nor contemplate the house of God without talking about and contemplating Christ. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are in many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Thomas says, we don't know the way. We don't know where you're going. And Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Can't talk about the house of God without talking about the Son of God. And you can't talk about the gate of heaven without talking about Christ. For Christ in John 10 and verse 9 speaks of the door or gate of heaven. And listen to what he says. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. I am the door. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He shall be saved. He shall be saved. I'm a singing fool this morning. Uh, Make sure that you have Christ. He is your only way to God's house. He is the only gate to heaven. And Jacob in a specified way reminds us of that this morning. Verse 18, I'm reading. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. Oh, folks, please engage. When you meet up with the one true God, when he reminds you of his multifaceted promises, when you get to fellowship and commune with God, sometimes even corporately like what you and I are doing this morning, There's only one thing to do. That is the sacrifice. To build an altar. This is what Jacob does. He builds an altar and he sacrifices. I want you to listen to Dr. Henry Morris's words here. Since the altar, like the ladder in the dream represented the means by which man could approach God, it was appropriate that the now invisible dream be commemorated by a visible altar. And of course, you can't talk about an altar without talking about sacrifice. Jacob, remember, he's on journey. he wouldn't have had any sacrificial animals with him. And so he offers a drink offering with the oil that he was carrying. And as Jacob pours out his drink offering, he's promising to be poured out in sacrificial service 
to his great God. Again, a singing fool, broken and spilled out just for love of you, Jesus, my most precious treasure lavished on thee. Broken and spilled out and poured at your feet in sweet abandon. Let me be spilled out and used up for thee. Oh, if he's saved you. No, can I say it again? Because we sometimes practically walk away from the greatest thing in all of life. If he's saved you, then there's only one thing to do. That is sacrifice. And of course, you know enough about the matter to know that what God is requiring of you and me this morning, in contradistinction to Jacob, is, is he's not looking for us to build a physical altar and, and to provide a physical sacrifice via the animal kingdom. Rather, he is anticipating that we will be embracing Paul's words in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is a good and perfect will of God. Oh, if he's saved you, if he has saved me, only one legitimate thing to do is to make ourselves a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. So make sure you're saved this morning. Again, want to go to God's house only through God's Son. You want to enter the gate of heaven, only Jesus is the ticket. Make sure you're saved this morning, and, and then if you are, just contemplate what he's worthy of. That's what true biblical worship is. Ascribing to him his worth-ship. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment this morning, please. I want to talk, first of all, to those of you who may be here again within the sound of his voice who have not yet trusted Christ. May I reiterate, but may I begin with the bad news the bad news is we all are sinners and our sin very effectively separates us from God. Sadly, not only in this life, but in the life to come. The good news is Jesus Christ has done everything that needs to be done in order for us to be saved. He has done everything that needs to be done for us to have an intimate and personal relationship with the God who created us. Christ crucified, bearing the penalty of our sin on Calvary's cross, buried, risen, and coming again. Uh oh, folks, make sure you know him. And if you don't, would you pray this prayer with me? You can use your own 
words. And you can do it in the quiet recesses of your heart. Lord, I've been reminded of the fact that I'm a sinner and that my sin effectively separates me from you. But Christ came and bore the penalty of my sin on Calvary's cross. He died for me. And so it's he and he alone through his death, burial, and resurrection that offers to me the forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life. And heaven is my eternal home. And this morning I'm praying to receive Christ as my own personal Savior. Listen, I would desire to do nothing that would be embarrassing to you, but as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you prayed that prayer this morning for the first time, I would love to know. Would you raise your hand just for a moment? I'll acknowledge that a hand has been raised, and you can place it back down. You prayed to receive Christ as your personal Savior today. And child of God, what would you say to him as we have been so succinctly yet powerfully reminded of the fact that he has saved us. We were on the road to eternal loss and ruin, and through simple childlike faith, we were graciously and mercifully placed on the Jesus road. We're confident about heaven. We know our sins have been forgiven. He has suffered through our hell. How should we then live? Oh God, may we ascribe to you your worthship. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.